So in this video, we'll uh, apply our newfound knowledge of artificial neural networks on the linear regression problem for diabetes. So just as a reminder, we have our input layer, which is where the input features um, are, uh, are enumerated. Then we have our hidden layer. Potentially, we have multiple hidden layers. We'll limit ourselves to one hidden layer here. And we have our output layer. And the other things that are important are, of course, the activation functions at each of those layers, the hidden layer and the output layer. Um, and then of course there's also the loss function that we're trying to um, trying to uh, minimize. So the loss function that we're using in this case is just going to be the same as the loss function in regular linear regression or in our uh, um, k nearest neighbors. That's just a function that will help us optimize the values of those weights and biases in the, in the arrows and in each of the, the neurons here. So let's look at our diabetes data set. Um, so as you remember, this is included in scikit-learn, so we can just include it. Um, we'll start off by just looking at one feature. In this case, it will be the feature two, or um, in other words, the third feature in that um, vector of, uh, um, of, of features in this data set. Um, and I think that was the body mass index, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly. So then we'll do the usual thing. We'll shuffle our data, um, and then on the shuffled data, we'll pick our um, training and our test data set based on the size of the, the number of entries in that uh, data set. So all but the last 20 will be for training, and the last 20 um, uh, entries in that data set will be for testing. So nothing new here. Um, We'll start off with a, a linear activation function. So in this case, this is called the identity because it projects z onto fc equal to z itself. Um, and we'll add a single hidden layer with 10 uh, neurons. So this is what we give here. Hidden layer size, that's a tuple of 10, um, which indicates that's, that there's just one hidden layer. There's only one element in this tuple. Um, and there's 10 neurons in that, um, in that layer. The activation function is identity, and we'll ask it to print some output so we can see what's going on. So this creates our multilayer perceptron regressor. Um, there's a similar function that is MLP classifier. Uh, if we want to do a classification problem here, we're doing a regression problem because remember this is the part where the output variable was a score uh, which could be continuously varying. And then we'll fit the data to um, uh, will fit our regression uh, multilayer perceptron to the training data. So all of this is the same kind of um, syntax that we've used before. Uh, so the fit function takes as x values the training data and, as, and, and y values of the training data. Um, so this is similar. All of these functions in scikit-learn have a very similar calling syntax so that you can e easily swap them out. So as you can see, it, it uh, um, has a number of iterations. This is what happens when it's trying to minimize the loss. Um, and so for each iteration, it prints out the loss at that time. And you can see that this goes down slowly um, until at some point it reaches uh, a value of here, 13,500. And it says that after a maximum of 200 iterations, which is the default, it still hasn't converged. Um, we could see that indeed if we plot the um, the loss curve which we get from that regression so uh, we started here at iteration zero and indeed when we get to iteration 200 we haven't um, converged yet we can still we can see that we're still going down in our um, loss function so let's redo this and let's now specify the maximum number of iterations equal to 4000 um, obviously this might take a little bit longer um, there will be a lot more output. So we go down 300, 400, 500, 600 iterations. And as you can see, the loss is down to 6,000 now from 13,000. Um, if we plot the loss curve, you see we started at zero. Then indeed at 200, we were only just a little bit lower than the initial loss. Um, and then we can could still go further down. And after 1,000 iterations, our loss was about um, uh, about 25% of where we started. And as you can see, even at 4,000 iterations, it is still slowly, slowly going down. Um, so let's look 
Uh, so that means, of course, that we can keep on training and training and training. Um, of course, we run the risk that we're now starting to overfit our, um, our, our neural network. So we're not gaining anything. We're just trying to describe the, the, the training data better, um, but we'd probably lose out on the test data. We can look at uh, coefficients. So this is what we did in the case of linear regression as well. Um, so we've got our uh, coefficients from, so we've got two layers of weights, one from layer zero, the input layer, to the hidden layer. So that goes from, um, from one input feature to 10 hidden, um, hidden layer features. So we've got uh, a matrix with 10 elements, a column matrix. And then we go from layer one to layer two, the output layer. Um, and then, of course, we have another matrix, which is now um, a row matrix, or which is now a column matrix with, with 10 elements. Um, and so, of course, um, we can see how this, uh, how this looks for our scores. So you can see that our um, regression score or mean square error um, for our training data set is 0 0.3. Um, for our test data set 0 0.22. Okay, all of that makes sense. We can look at predictions based on the training data set um, and predictions based on the test data set. And we can plot those with respect to each other. And you see that indeed we have a linear dependence here between the input feature um, and the output um, target variable that we're trying to replicate. Of course, all of this is done with a single input feature and a linear um, or identity activation function. So now what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll apply the same kind of analysis, but now with logistic activation function. So we're adding nonlinearity, which supposedly will be able to describe our data better. Um, and we'll include all 10 um, input features to really take advantage of all of the statistical power in this, um, in this data set. So again, we'll go back Let's see, let's start here. So we'll change the activation function to a logistic activation function. Um, and uh, well, we need to go back and change the number of features. So we'll use all 10 features here. So we'll reconstruct our training and our test data sets. Um, we'll skip this part where we didn't have enough iterations. And so here we will do the training or the construction of our, our neural network with the logistic activation function and then immediately train it. So you see we start with a similar loss function at about 14,000. One of the things you may have noticed, it took a little bit longer for this to complete because nonlinear functions tend to take longer than linear functions. In particular, they take longer than the identity function. Um, so if we scroll down, how many iterations did it take us? Um, so it took us 4,000 iterations. We were not completely converged yet. Um, one of the things you see in this MLP regressor output is that it uses a um, tolerance, where is it here, of 0 0.0001. So 10 to the minus four um, is uh, when it will be satisfied in uh, how much um, the, the loss is, um, is still decreasing. So as soon as the loss is decreasing um, less than uh, this tolerance, that's when it will stop. So we can look at the loss curve. Um, you see it decreases a little bit slower. It's still going down here at 4,000. Um, we can look at the coefficients, but um, uh, so first of all, what we see is that we now have 10 input features. So the number of weights in going from layer zero, the input layer, to our hidden layer, layer one. That's now 100 coefficients. And then from our hidden layer, 10, um, 10 hidden neurons, to our output layer, which was a single variable, we still have a column matrix of um, 10 by one. So that didn't change, but we have now 100 variables here um, as opposed to uh, just 10. We can look at our regression scores. Um, because of the way the logistic um, regression, uh, because of the, the, the fact that we're now using a logistic activation function, um, we now have a different kind of output. It's not going to be the actual value. Um, so uh, so the, the error, uh, the loss function is defined somewhat differently, but we can make predictions. Um, and one of the things we see is that when we 
don't have enough iterations, this model actually hasn't converged yet, so it doesn't um, doesn't do very well. So one of the things we'll have to do is go back here and run for more iterations. Oops, that was the wrong wrong. So if we run for a large number of iterations, twenty thousand, um, we may be able to um, reach convergence. Uh, one of the things that we should of course keep in mind is that this is a fairly small data set so now we reached convergence after 9000 um, entries so as you can see we're much um, we've leveled off in our learning here um, we can see what our dependence is now um, and this is should be um, a fairly uh, reasonable um, uh, prediction now. One of the things of course that you see is that it first of all it isn't lying on a line. Um, this wouldn't be the case for a linear activation function either because we're looking at this now for 10 independent variables so even though in this one variable that I'm plotting um, there may be a linear dependence in the case of a linear activation function we don't even have that. Um, but even in, um, in, in that even all the um, the influence of all the other nine variables that aren't plotted here can cause um, the distribution of these uh, these points. Okay, so that's um, this kind of uh, approach of neural networks applied to um, or diabetes data set. Just keep in mind that this was a fairly small data set with a relatively limited um, statistical power, and we were trying to, after all, determine about a hundred weights going into the um, hidden layer, about ten weights going in from the hidden layer to the output layer, and of course a um, hundred or, or about um, yeah about ten um, um, intercepts or, or biases B values um, for our hidden layer and another B value for our output layer. So um, that's a fairly large number of um, of parameters, and that's why. This kind of approach with artificial neural networks typically works better for um, large data sets. So in the next um, section, we'll actually use this on a, on a really large data set, um, where the number of variables will go up even further. But you'll see that this is exactly where artificial neural networks um, do, a, do a really good job.